an FBI-controlled encrypted phone network ensures that criminals are getting their one phone call. Smile, I hear you have some details around an FBI operation that recently came to light. Sure. So this one is fascinating. Uh, it's more than just an FBI operation. It's actually an international police operation. And I think FBI and the Australian Federal Police, or AFP, really took point on this one. So you've probably heard in the last couple of years of different services that cater to criminals um, that sell specifically uh, encrypted chat apps or encrypted devices for criminals to use to communicate. Because obviously criminals have uh, an operational security problem. They don't want to get caught. Mm -hmm. Uh, so they try to do, to do their best uh, to prevent other people from reading their messages, which is something that law enforcement can typically do, is read text messages, emails, things like that. Um, in the past few years, you've probably heard of EncroChat, uh, Sky ECC, Phantom Secure, all in that space. Uh, the, the newest one uh, would be Anom. And the interesting thing about Anom is that it was actually set up as a sting operation by the FBI and the AFP. So uh, apparently a confidential human source in the Phantom Secure case came to uh, FBI or AFP and said, I've got this app that I'm building to do encrypted chat. Do you want it? And of course, law enforcement jumped at this chance. And the way that it operated was that they would try and get these into the hands of criminals through, you know, uh, other confidential human sources, people who they could sort of sell this to as a legitimate encrypted chat program. And in fact, more than just a program, these were handsets that were designed specifically for this purpose and sold exclusively, as far as we know, to criminals. So they would be marketed as something you can do use to do your dirty deeds without anyone spying on you. Um, they would be like a phone with just like a calculator and maybe it looks like that's about it. But once you put in a special code, you can use the chat version of the app. Now, this was sending ostensibly encrypted messages uh, between people. But messages were also being forwarded, encrypted with a master key, to servers that were set up specifically for interception. And then eventually they would make their way to the FBI. Um, actually, a really interesting part of it that I hadn't read until just today is that apparently no arrests have been made so far in the U.S. for this because of the laws that we have uh, preventing FBI agents from downloading and reading the messages from U.S. accounts. Now, I don't know how true that is. I read that in, uh, I think it was uh, ABC as an Australian news outlet. I read their article about it. I'd love to learn more. But apparently Australia does not have such laws, which might have been why they were involved in this. Um, different jurisdictions can treat this data differently. Uh, and I had read that the there was some sort of encryption and decryption shuffle between one server and another to make sure this was all above board in the, the respective jurisdictions. Anyway, this ran since about, I think, 2018, October. Uh, they just arrested around 800 people as a result of the evidence they gathered by having criminals use this network. Um, which is wild. I mean, this this was sold to you know in Italian mafia, um, uh, motorcycle gangs, drug dealers, and yeah, it's it's pretty wild that this has just all come to light. And then they swooped in, and this was not just within the U.S. and Australia. Um, the information was shared overseas with other police organizations, and arrests were made in, in various different countries as a result. Um, it is an interesting. Uh, way around the problem of encryption on most people's handsets. I mean, notably, Apple has been uh, a strong proponent of encryption for everybody, um, and law enforcement has had a problem with that for a while. Um, rather than fight Apple on their own platform to try and get access to the encrypted data on that platform, the response by law enforcement is to convince criminals to use a law enforcement controlled platform and gather the evidence that way, which is pretty clever. You have to admit. Uh, it actually has some, some parallels um, like uh, for other types of um, I'm going to lump this into a type of social engineering kind of operation mm -hmm. uh, where you've seen um, law enforcement send out, you know, things like 
hey, you've won a, you know, bus trip to a casino kind of a thing. Show up at this date and time, right? And they end up collecting a bunch of people to have outstanding bench warrants, right? Just, you know, make them come to you. So it's a similar kind of thing. Um, and I think it's a brilliant strategy. Uh, I'm, I'm surprised that operationally um, that the cat's out of the bag, right? I mean, I see like this would be something that they would want to uh, keep going, um, you know, but they have, you know, an ocean of evidence at this point, 27 million intercepted messages, you know, with criminal organizations running in over 100 countries. Um, but one of the things I thought was particularly interesting was that part of their strategy to drive adoption was to take down other competing secure platforms. And they actually went through and actually there were a couple other ones that were in that kind of same space that they actually managed to shut down over the course of this operation, leaving criminal syndicates with a void in that space. So they created a need, which is brilliant, right? You create a need for a solution and then be the only solution in the market. You see rapid adoption, you get, get the evidence, and then you're able to take action on target. Um, so uh, all in all, I think, you know, just a really great story, right? Uh, it's very, very cool. Well, I had heard of a similar tactic, not with uh, encryption apps, but with darknet markets in particular. Um, I remember it was that Silk Road 2 was famously uh, a law enforcement sting after Silk Road and other markets were taken down. Um, the people who were using them had to go somewhere to continue their business. So they ended up on ones that were controlled by law enforcement and did their business there. And were I, I, at least they were... Evidence was at least gathered. I don't know how many arrests came out of that, but I guess a significant number did. Um, there was another book that I had read a while ago, and I want to say it's Kingpin by Kevin Polson, but I can't be sure. But there was uh, famously a market. This is pre, pre-Tor. Um, there was a market that was also run by the FBI with the understanding that, you know, the guy running it at the top was, actually, I think, an FBI agent. Um, and everyone was doing their business there, and they just kept collecting the logs, you know, that's, that's how it goes. Um, I wanted, I wanted your take on what do you think this is going to have an impact on the future of these kinds of applications? Cause I, I hear a lot of people discussing online that, you know, once you've got a network like this, that from the very start was a law enforcement sting, how can you possibly go out into the market with a brand new one and say, Hey, we're totally not law enforcement, but we'd like you to put all your sensitive information inside of our encrypted app, please use us. Like, I, I feel like it's a real hard sell at that point. I think that criminals are becoming more technically sophisticated, but as part of that sophistication, they're also recognizing that they can make money with less risk by selling solutions to less sophisticated criminals, right? Yeah. And so there's going to be, I think, a population uh, of criminal actors that are going to um, not uh, necessarily have the history, not do the due diligence. They are going to be very opportunistic in nature, um, which seems to go hand in hand uh, with that particular, uh, you know, job. <laughs> and uh, so I think you're going to see these things continue to be uh, effective to a degree. Um, I also think, however, for more sophisticated threat actors, you might see a proliferation of bespoke encryption act uh, applications being made because Ultimately, it's not that difficult uh, to create such an application. Um, you know, you get some very well-educated individuals, you know, PhDs from various other, you know, malicious countries. They can code these things up. It's not that difficult. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if large-scale um, you know, uh, malicious actor, actor operations such as, you know, Russian mafia, Italian mafia, you know, the triads, I, I would be surprised if they uh, weren't already, at least in some cases, using bespoke applications already. Well, I'm, another article I remember doing on the show a while ago is that uh, the cartels in Mexico, I believe specifically El Chapo and his group, I guess, kidnapped or otherwise convinced like telecom engineers to set up a separate cell network. So like you can you can have your guys learn this stuff where you can just threaten the life of somebody who has the information and make them build it for you. I mean, there's ways to do it. 